the screen? Perfect, yes. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that technical hitch. Um, thank you very much um, to all of you for inviting Yorgos and myself to uh, give this paper. We're delighted to be part of this really interesting um, conference. Um, so our topic then is Cypriot Aphrodite and British colonial um, discourse uh, reappraisal. In this paper, we use the lens of Aphrodite to explore the theme of the conference, empire and excavation, taking excavation in its broadest sense, archeologically to mean archeologically recovered objects, sites and locations, and considering relevant imagery reproduced in official representations during the period of British rule, 1878 to 1960. We take the material past and its cultural heritage to be entangled with the construction of memory and with local, national and imperial identities. In contrast to the classic perceptions of Greek Aphrodite, who has primarily been regarded as a goddess of love, desire and beauty, her ancient cult on Cyprus, illustrated here by this um, array of images, including the wonderful artwork of Glenn's Forks, has always been understood as overseeing all aspects of human life, from social order, fertility and sexuality, to political, maritime and military power. This bond between the island and the Cypriot-born Aphrodite has become iconic ranging from scholarly debates regarding her origins and her ancient cult to permeating popular imaginings and ideological representations of colonial and post-colonial Cyprus at multiple levels. As Robert Merrilies has noted, in Cyprus, Aphrodite needs no introduction. She is, as he says, her own calling card. This divine cultural ambassador thus has a modern biographical trajectory in an array of imagery from both governmental and popular tourist branding through to stamps and currency. And in this necessarily short paper, we will focus in particularly on postage stamps, as well as some other imagery that illustrates Aphrodite's role as a personification of the island in British representations. Earlier scholarly papers by Michael Given, Corrupting Aphrodite in 2002, Yanis Papadakis, Aphrodite's Delights in 2006, have provided important and rich historical context and interpretation. They have each shown the complex ways in which Aphrodite's image could be politically manipulated and given identifies a colonialist narrative in which classical and Hellenizing aspects of the Cypriot past were suppressed by the British since Enosis, the desire for union with Greece, very clearly did not suit the British agenda. In taking a closer look at imagery on stamps, we revisit this idea and ask if it is expressed in the philatelic designs with reference to Aphrodite and other ancient images. And we note here that stamp designs were always carefully selected and officially controlled. Before doing so, it will be useful to just take a very brief look back at more recent imagery, reminding ourselves of how ubiquitous Aphrodite has become as an icon and giving us a point of comparison with material pre-1960. Most obviously, a specific image of the goddess lies at the heart of this imagery, and here she is, the marble nude Aphrodite from Soli. Her silhouette, of course, forms the logo of the Cyprus tourism organization, evoking her traditional role as a goddess of love with a heart and her distinctive birth from the sea, the waves. The staying power of this image is illustrated too through its co-option or commodification by Coca-Cola Hellas as part of their glocalization campaign, the making the global local in different parts of Greece as well as Cyprus. The 19th 2017 limited edition here that you see, of course, celebrates Paphos as European capital of culture and appropriately bears the goddess in her solely form. And the subsequent designs to the right give the goddess center stage, but with a supporting cast of other images from Cypriot history and culture. Turning now more specifically to the stamps, let us first of all emphasize the important role that coins and stamps have traditionally played in the expression and projection of identity. And I think that we can sometimes a little bit forget that because perhaps we're connected more digitally than by our post. And of course, um, certainly now as well, uh, we're all using our, our 
um, plastic cards more than coinage, but they would have been part of the everyday lives um, of people in this um, earlier times. The importance of these um, communication devices is eloquently expressed by the Irish writer and politician W.B. Yeats, who speaks of stamps and coins as, quote, the silent ambassadors of national taste. And I note that he, um, importantly, then oversaw the design of Ireland's first independent modern currency. Illustrated on the slide are the first set of definitive stamps issued by the newly independent state of Cyprus. They depict a mixture of natural resources and monuments, and the classical or Hellenizing imagery stands out in the presence of two named deities, Apollo and Aphrodite, as well as the sanctuary of Apollo and a view of Salamis, and those are, are marked out with the little red stars on the slide. The Aphrodite head shown here to the lower right also during excavation is identified on the stamp both in English and in Greek as Aphrodite and was uh, identified as such by Vassos Kariorgis. Note too that until the new stamps had been produced the old colonial stamps simply had to do and this is what we're seeing on the uh, left. They were simply overstamped to show the change in political um, circumstance. And we've shown again here uh, for, for comparison, an Irish uh, comparison. Um, and this is the, the overstamping of the head of the king uh, with the Sushtat Aaron, the state of Aaron. And you can see that it's a rather more brutal overstamping, uh, completely erasing the um, visage of the king. From this time on, Aphrodite remains, and still remains today, a popular choice in stamp sets and, and other official communications. In 1966, we see here, the iconic Soli Aphrodite appears on her own on a plain background on a stamp. And in 1979 and 1982, she appears again, but the iconography has become more elaborate. Here she is paired with later paintings, connecting to uh, later high value art and also to Europe, Botticelli's Venus, who is nonetheless transported to a Cypriot setting, the Rock of Aphrodite, and paired also with Titian's Venus. Much more briefly, the goddess is also incorporated into a narrative iconography, marking Cyprus's accession into the European Union and its adoption of the euro. And of course, the new coinage again provides uh, for all the countries in the euro a new opportunity to signal um, and communicate uh, their identity. A word first, though, about the Soli Aphrodite herself before turning to the uh, colonial period stamps. Uh, when we were researching this, we became quite intrigued by her. She has, of course, become the face of the Hellenizing Cypriot goddess. And she's recorded as having come from uh, informal digging, let us say, not an excavation, at Soli in 1901. And the sources for that are on the slide. An opportunity to enrich this object biography came from conversation with our colleague Panayotis Panayidis, and it's with his permission and we're grateful to him that we share the details as recounted to him by his grandmother and great grandmother. The story goes that the statue was found during plough by a local who hid it in a barn with a view to selling it but it was eventually confiscated by the colonial police, the British, and ended up, of course, in the uh, museum collections. Uh, we think it will be interesting to look further into this and to try and find out how the statue was reported at the time and what value was attached to it, thus continuing to enrich its modern biography and reception. Turning now to the period of British rule. We begin with this well-known image published in Punch, August 1878, recording for a British audience the arrival of the first British High Commissioner, Sir Garnet Wolsey. And I'd just like to mention here, since we're sitting in Dublin, that he was born in Dublin and was actually Anglo-Irish, as indeed were so many um, of the administrators under empire, uh, giving Ireland a rather complex position as um, implicated in empire, but also colonized. Although the British officer offers flowers and seems to woo the goddess, we are left in no doubt who is now in charge. The British flag is wrapped around her lower body. 
The image is often reproduced without the accompanying text below, a ditty or poem, and you can just see it there. It's in three columns, uh, quite hard to read. So we've reproduced it for you on the right hand of the site. And as you see, Venus Loquitur, Venus speaks and dresses Sir Garnard, and you can read the text yourself. The general gist of it is very uh, clear. The goddess and her island um, have been taken over by the British. And as she says, my Cyprus to renew. The goddess and her island are feminized as under the masculine power of empire. And the very clear metaphoric link between the goddess and Cyprus um, is shown also that on the, on the back um, of um, her shoulders, uh, the word Cyprus is also written. To illustrate just briefly um, that these kinds of sentiments were quite widespread and that this was the way in which uh, Cyprus was represented to um, a, a public outside the island, um, one other um, poem. You'll be pleased to know we're not going to go through this poem in detail. It's 133 lines long, uh, but I commend it to you. I mean, it's uh, a typical Victorian type poem. It's full of the most incredibly detailed uh, mythic allusions, showing very detailed knowledge of the myths of Aphrodite and other myths as well. While it focuses on the arrival of Sir Garnet again, this 1883 poem interestingly juxtaposes Venus and Queen Victoria, as is obvious from the title, it's the name of the poem. And here, what is really interesting is the obvious asymmetry of power. In the first stanza, we are told that Venus is now relegated to a jewel in Victoria's crown. And by the end stanza, which we've got there on the other side, uh, we are told that it is now Victoria who reigns in Venus's grove. So in other words, uh, the goddess has been displaced by the queen. Status as a British protectorate and then later a colony brought with it British control over coinage and stamps. Both are important economically and so have an indexical economic role. They also both offered ample opportunity for symbolic messaging addressed in the case of stamps to both a local and an international audience, and indeed to stamp collecting. And I know from talking with our students, not many people collect stamps anymore, uh, but it was all the rage from the late 19th century. Um, so there was another economic um, audience then for the stamps. As shown here on the left, the earlier stamps across empire simply showed the head of the ruler, Victoria and her immediate male successors appearing on all issues. It was only later that the idea of pictorial stamps emerged, creating a canvas for communicating the distinctive features of the constituent members of Britain's so-called imperial family. 1928 marked 50 years of British rule, termed by the British establishment a jubilee year for Cyprus. For this, the commemorative set of stamps shown here was issued, and these are the island's first set of pictorial stamps. The personalities involved are important and interesting, and there's definitely more work to be done here. The designs were overseen by the then governor, Sir Ronald Storr. It is also recorded that the King, George V, personally approved them. And what's interesting here was that he was part of this rage for stamp collecting. We're told he was a very passionate stamp collector in his spare time. The set of stamp, 10 stamps shows a mixture of themes. There are three religious buildings. There's one local religious scene with St. Barnabas, three scenes emphasizing strongly British rule, past and present. That includes uh, Richard uh, the Lionheart. The British ones are marked with the um, green stars. And the statue um, of Richard the Lionheart is one that's located in London. And then the highest value stamp, the one pound, of course, reserved for the king. We identified two, three stamps, so they're marked out with the red stars as having ancient or mythic content. A coin from Amethyst, the Hellenistic philosopher Zeno of Kittium, and a map of the island, the, the red stamp, which where to the west near Paphos, Aphrodite rises from the sea in reference to her mythic uh, birth. So she is um, shown in more detail. While British power is very obviously foregrounded as one might expect on a jubilee issue, the ancient classical past is by no means silenced, despite evidence elsewhere that the British governor, Ronald Storr, so in official writings and discourse and um, as so eloquently 
argued by Given, um, has been that it was suppressing Hellenic aspects of Cypriot history. And that, that doesn't seem sort of terribly obvious from the, the, the range of the stamps. And there is, I think, interesting work to be done researching Storz more, uh, Storr more because he was also involved in the production of stamps um, in the Middle East um, as well. In 1934, the first definitive as opposed to commemorative set of stamps were issued, uh, again under George V, uh, and these same or similar stamps are uh, carried on under subsequent rulers too. The set has an overall coherence in that they are mostly monuments from Cyprus's history, often set in landscapes, and they are all labelled in English, of course. Three stamps in similar proportion to the 1928 set all clearly depict antiquity. The three sites shown are Vuni, Salamis and Soli. The presence of columns and of a theatre signal, even to the most casual viewer, I think, a classical Hellenizing or Greco-Roman past. Beyond that, it's noteworthy that two of the sites, Vuni and Soli, which we've heard about quite a few times in different contexts over the past two days, were being excavated by the Swedish Cyprus expedition, and thus they're very topical as a choice of image. A new set of stamps was not issued in pictorial form until the accession of another queen, Queen Elizabeth II. There is here a more obvious change in emphasis, as about 50% of the stamps are concerned now with the island's resources, carobs, grapes and origin, oranges, as well as farming, mining, and we heard about the importance of that from Lena yesterday, forestry, and also maritime trade illustrated through ships and harbours. Monuments are present, but none of them are ancient. Three images again reference the ancient world, but we may suggest in a rather more circumscribed way. A coin from Paphos on the 25 mil stamp and a set of coin-like images uh, from ancient Cypriot kingdoms. Um, those are the two high value stamps on the, the sort of lower right, but they're paired with a set of heraldic images. So the kind of messaging seems to be less about Cypriot or, or Greek identity um, than power and kingship and its continuity through time. There is a reference to Aphrodite, but not her image, and it is the coastal view labelled Beach of Aphrodite. If stamps are being used as an active canvas for ideology and identity, as is extremely common um, then as now, it is in perhaps here in resi as resistance to British rule intensified that the classical and the Hellenic becomes more muted. But what then of Aphrodite? In the earliest sets of stamps, she maintains a quiet presence. Sites that are special to her appear on the stamps, Amethyst, Soli, Paphos. And her birth scene on the 1928 stamp reinforces the island's special claim on her rising from the sea off the coast of Paphos. On this 1955 stamp, uh, we today recognize this beach, of course, as the rock of Aphrodite, the Petra Ptolemyu, but it's labeled, as you see here, it just says the beach of Aphrodite. Careful historiographic work by Robert Merrilies has shown that the rock, as opposed to the more general rising from the sea foam, is a modern mythic addition. And in this context, too, the stamp is actually one of the earliest images known to attest to this um, development of this mythic story. And as a closing thought, if meaning resides with the viewer, although the British Queen here oversees the scene, might me not now in retrospect see here traces of the goddess Aphrodite reclaiming her home from Elizabeth, the goddess usurping the Queen, in counterpoise to the colonizing Victoria who displaced the goddess Venus. Thank you uh, very much. <laughs>